Well, let's speak to Yuka Kobayashi, who's a lecturer at Soas University of London. She's an expert on China and international politics. Thanks for making time to talk to us. So obviously there's a number of things on the agenda. Russia is a concern. China is a concern. But also, if we look at the chosen venue uh, for this meeting, Hiroshima, not just the prime minister's hometown, but also symbolically important as he tries to put nuclear disarmament on the agenda. Absolutely. I think you're actually witnessing a very historical moment where the G7 is meeting in Hiroshima. It was very controversial when Obama visited some seven years ago. And I think it's very um, momentous that we see all the leaders of the G7 actually um, um, visiting the Peace Dome and actually trying to make a stand tomorrow. One of the key things in the agenda is nuclear um, non-proliferation. So I think we're coming to a very interesting juncture where they're actually trying to emphasize this idea of peace. And it's something that really... Um, uh, um, Kishida really wants to push forward, trying to kind of put for, forward this kind of identity of him coming from Hiroshima, his hometown. And the consensus is that economic security is just as important as national security. Of course, there is this delicate balance where countries still need to ch trade with China, but they're trying to push back the gains that China has made in terms of making several economies dependent uh, on China. So how is that balance being struck? Language is going to be very important. Absolutely. I think in a sense, this idea of economic security really came in right after kind of the um, uh, war in Ukraine and um, also coming off of um, the lockdown from COVID and um, uh, uh, this kind of um, inability to have access to key things like infrastructure, critical minerals. So I think in a way, um, energy and food security also, also come on the agenda. So um, in, in a sense, we're actually witnessing sort of countries decoupling from China or de-risking as the EU has um, preferred to call it. So it is a very interesting time in the sense that we're actually seeing very different kind of approaches, even coming out from sort of the G7, um, very evident with Macron's visit um, earlier um, this year to um, where he actually emphasized that he actually wanted to have much more of a different kind of approach than the United States. So I think in a way this G7 is about really uniting these kinds of democratic countries of the G7 and the United front against Russia, and much remains to be seen whether or not they're able to do this and balance these economic needs at the same time. And while this is happening in Japan, China is having its own meeting in Xinjiang with uh, Central Asian heads. Yes, the Central Asian summit that's taking place for the first time is very interesting, and the timing is very interesting. And it's just started at the same time as the G7. So they're actually timing it at the same time to really make this kind of gesture and a symbolic move to counter a lot of this kind of um, uh, projection coming from Hiroshima. So we're actually seeing China really try to actually assert this kind of influence in Central Asian states very close to what's happening in the war in Ukraine. We also heard um, pr uh, President Xi actually call Zelensky in a sense that China is actually moving towards this kind of mediating role. So we're seeing a very interesting turn in um, China in the sense that we're not seeing just this kind of uh, strong, powerful China, but one that's actually trying to become a mediator and a normative actor in international relations. And we're actually seeing the G7 as kind of um, somewhere to counter this with what Japan really tries to um, emphasize through this free and open Indo-Pacific, which has become this kind of pillar for the Indo-Pacific tilt. Well, already we're hearing messages about unity, unity not just within the G7, but within the global response to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This year, the leaders of Australia, Brazil, uh, India, Vietnam have been invited. Uh, is this a push to try and get members of the so-called Global South onto the same page? Absolutely. That's a very interesting um, a change in the sense that we're actually seeing the G7 move towards more... Um, kind of proactive ways of engaging with the global south because we're actually seeing the global south feel a bit um alienated given that um, the G7 has been very um, involved in the Ukraine crisis. So at the same time, they felt alienated in the sense that there are other kind of crises around the world, yet not the similar kind of hand has been extended. So in order to really engage the Global South, that becomes very imperative for any kind of, you know, Hiroshima G7 statement in engaging um, the global world, given that the Global South has the majority of the global population. So here in Hiroshima, they've actually taken the step to engage non-G7 
G7 actors to really bring forward something that doesn't just cover the G7 mentality about where the world order is going, but go beyond that. All right, Yuka, thank you very much for setting the stage for us as this meeting commences. Uh, Yuka Kobayashi, lecturer at SOAS University in London, thank you for your time.